The Exxon Radio Show with Rob McConnell is largely an opinion talk show. All opinions, comments, or statements of fact expressed by Rob McConnell's guests are strictly their own and are not to be construed as those of the Exxon Radio Show or endorsed in any manner by Rob McConnell, Relmar McConnell Media Company, the Exxon Broadcast Network, its affiliated networks, stations, employees, or advertisers. Radio. Welcome to the X Zone, a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell. everyone it is tuesday july the 12th 2016 i am rob mcconnell and we're coming to you from our broadcast center in hamilton ontario canada if you'd like to send us an email during the show you can always send it to studio at exxon radio tv.com on all social media sites exxon radio tv and our website at www.exzone radio tv.com And we're coming to you from our studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, on the Mutual Broadcast Network, where we're found Monday through Friday from 11 p.m. Eastern until 2 a.m. Eastern. And you can enjoy the rest of the great programming we have here on the Mutual Broadcast Network by visiting our website, www.mutualbroadcast.net. Hope everybody had a great evening. The weather here in Hamilton, Ontario was scorching today. It hit 92 degrees. And I know for some of the people who listen to the show and live down in Arizona and other parts of the United States where it's really hot, they say, oh my God, 92 degrees. What a wuss. Hey, listen, this is Canada. You'll uh, you'll all be thinking about us come November, you know. After your elections, one way or another, Canada's going to look mighty great. My first guest tonight is a good friend of mine. Uh, His name is Kevin Randall. Some people call him Dr. Kevin Randall. Other people call him Colonel Kevin Randall. But to the members of the Exxon, he is Kevin Randall. No disrespect to his doctorate or to his title. He uh, he's the prominent UFO investigator and ufologist. Now, within the UFO community, he is often regarded as one of the most preeminent experts on the reported crash of a UFO near Roswell, New Mexico, in July of 1947. A professional writer with more than 80 books to his credit, Kevin is perhaps best known for his books about UFOs and the Roswell story. While the vast majority of his books are science fiction and historical fiction, it's his books on the accounts of the Roswell story, that happened going back to 1947 that have um, had an enormous influence on those interested in the saga. Now, Kevin, along with Stanton Friedman, uh, they are considered by some as the most qualified and leading experts and researchers into the Roswell story. Joining me now is Dr. Colonel Kevin Randall. And welcome back to the show, Kevin. Thank you, Rob. I would like to point out, if it was 92 degrees Celsius, you guys would have melted. Not to mention all our igloos and all our snow. (laughs) Yes, there you go. (laughs) Hey, Kevin, I want to congratulate you on your new book, Roswell in the 21st Century, The Evidence as It Exists Today. What can you tell us about it, my friend? A number of years ago, I had decided that we needed to look at the Roswell case very carefully, treat it like a cold case, go back through the evidence that we had uh, discovered decade, literally decades mm-hmm. ago, go back through the interviews, go back through the videotapes, go back through the noise, go back through the documentation, and see what all I could learn piecing this whole thing together. I mean, at one point, this was the case. This was going to end everything. The the question was answered. We have been Mm -hmm. visited. It was a very robust case. 
And what I've discovered is we're basically left with some witnesses who told a story 35, 40, 50 years later. Wow. We don't have documentation. We don't have photographs. We don't have much anything except that testimony. All right, Kevin, stand by. We're going to come back with Dr. Colonel Kevin Randall, who's authored a new book, Roswell in the 21st Century, The Evidence as It Exists Today on the other side of this two-minute break. This is the Exxon. I am Rob McConnell, and we're coming to you live and around the world from our broadcast center here in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, on the Mutual Broadcast Network. Don't go away. The next generation of talk radio. special guest. He's the author of a new book entitled Roswell in the 21st Century, The Evidence as It Exists Today. Um, all right, I'm sorry that I had to cut you off there, my friend, but uh, the bills must get paid. And uh, I was wondering if we could continue because, you know, everyone who has ever heard of a UFO has also heard of the alleged Roswell crash of 1947. Absolutely. And the thing the thing about it is, I mean, this was the case. This this had supposedly everything you could want. It had the uh, bodies of the alien creatures. It had a recovered spacecraft. Uh, there would be photographs. There would be documents. There would be everything to prove that alien visitation is real. Mm-hmm. And in the 25 plus years I've investigated the case, I began seriously in uh, February of 1989. I'd done some work in 1988 on it. Uh, everything we heard about it was this was the case that would prove it. We didn't need any other UFO cases. This was it. Here we are in, in 2016. We're no, really no further along. All we have is the testimony. Some of it I find very credible from, from the uh, officers who the top ranking officers yeah. and NCOs at Roswell in 1947. But nobody kept a diary. Nobody wrote a letter. Nobody had a journal. Mm-hmm. The only the only diary we've ever found was kept by Ruth Barnett. She, the wife of Barney Barnett, who was supposedly out on the plains of San Augustine. And when you look at her um, diary, there's nothing to hint anything happened. Uh, supposedly, I know Stan says when you when you look at that, say, well, you, what do you expect? He came home, he was frightened, he didn't tell any, her anything about it. He just kept quiet because the military had threatened everybody. But supposedly, in November of that year, and this is the only year that, that Ruth Barnett kept the diary, 1947, in November of that year during Thanksgiving, that would be the Thanksgiving in the United States, not the one in Canada, that they sat around and he told everybody about it, but there's still nothing in the diary about it. Mm-hmm. The only conclusion we can draw is that if there was any event on the plains of San Augustine, it has absolutely nothing to do with the Roswell case. So, why do people look at Roswell, New Mexico, the alleged crash, as I call it, as the mecca of ufology. Once again, because that was where everything was supposed to be answered. That was where we we learned the truth mm-hmm. that there's alien visitation. That is the place where it all happened. Uh, from that point on, uh, everything else, while interesting, was basically irrelevant. The answers were in Roswell. And the answer that I found is it's not in Roswell. If you want to look at a good UFO case, Level Land, Texas, in November of 1957 is much better. But with uh, with Roswell, we supposedly were going to have it all, and we have just been unable to find any documentation. When when I talk about the book, I always say, well, it's going to it's going to piss off everybody. The 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 skeptics are going to be mad because I leave the door open based on some of the testimony given by the top. Uh, officers and NCOs at Roswell. But the believer is going to be annoyed because I take out everything else. There was a series of documents that were was written uh, after July of 1947. And while you could argue one of them, and it's the Twining letter from September 23rd, 1947, mm-hmm. where he's trying to set up, Twining being the 
commanding general of the Air Material Command, the top research facility for the for the military, he wrote he wrote a letter that says the phenomenon is something real and not illusionary and fictitious. Everybody says, yeah, yeah, that kind of goes goes with it. What they ignore is a paragraph further in the letter says the lack of crash recovered debris. Now I can make an argument that that does not close the door on Roswell based on the reason behind that letter and what he was doing specifically with his answers. But the problem is we find more and more documentation like that. Howard McCoy, who was the top intelligence officer around there in 1947, said on a number of occasions they had no crash debris, which especially in classified meetings and, and uh, where uh, minutes were kept, and these were classified minutes of the meeting, so you'd expect we civilians would never get to see them. But he, he said a number, in a, a number of occasions we don't have any crash debris. Ed Ruppelt, who was the commander of, or the, the, the chief of Project Blue Book in the 1950s, prepared in January of 1953 a briefing to go out to the um, Air Defense Command, to the various uh, units that would be involved in the investigation of UFOs from that point on. And it says right in there, you know, we have no physical evidence. We have no crash recovered debris. Here is a, we have a whole series of these documentation uh, classified at the time they were created, suggesting there's no class recovered debris. This is very, very critical information and it should be worrisome to everybody who believes that there was a crash at Roswell. On the other hand, as I say, we look at the testimony of the officers involved. Edwin Easley, who was the provost marshal, the top police officer on the base in 1947, uh, told me that the craft was extraterrestrial. I, I had asked him the question. He was always very circumspect in what he would say. He would, um, if I'd ask a question, he'd like, well, I can't answer that. I was sworn to secrecy. He, he had to say that to me a dozen times. We were having a discussion, and I said to him, are we following the right path? And he said, what do you mean? I said, we think it was extraterrestrial. He says, well, let me put it this way. It's not the wrong path. So here we have the top, one of the top officers yeah. in Roswell who should have known telling me that it was extraterrestrial. So we've got this real dichotomy there. We also see a reaction by the military on July 9th. July 8th, they announced they have a flying saucer. Hours later, they said, nah, nah, it's just a weather balloon. But the next day, July 9th, there's a whole series of articles in newspapers throughout the United States that says the Army and Navy moved today to stop so stories of flying saucers whizzing through the atmosphere. You look at the history and you say, well, gee, after Arnold on June 24th, they didn't seem to care. There's lots and lots of stories. There's speculation by military leaders about what these things might be. There's top scientists chiming in. There's all kinds of discussion about it. Suddenly on July 9th, they care about these stories appearing in the newspapers. You have to, what event precipitated that specific attempt to suppress the information? Good questions. Uh, the, the, the fact that it was the military who issued the, the press release, the first press release that went out, would this have been the catalyst to the UFO phenomenon? No, the catalyst was actually uh, in the United States with Kenneth Arnold. You have to remember back in 1946, mm -hmm. over Europe and Scandinavia, specifically Sweden, um, Finland, they had what they called the ghost rockets. Yeah. These seem to be, the descriptions seem to match the V-2 or V-1 rockets that the Germans had created during World War One or World War II. And you're wondering, who was firing these things over Sweden in 1946? And the idea was that it had been the Soviets attempting to uh, intimidate the, the Scandinavian governments. When the Soviet Union collapsed, there's a number of UFO researchers from the United States that went through their files on it. They found nothing to suggest that's true. So the ghost rockets are sort of unanswered. But one of the things they did, because they they didn't like all the publicity, they started suppressing the stories in the newspapers. You go back even further and you have the Foo Fighters from World War II, which worried the Allied powers greatly because right. they thought it might be some kind of weapon being by, developed by the Germans or by the Japanese, the mm -hmm. Axis powers, that they wouldn't be able to uh, combat. But when the war ended, they didn't care anymore because obviously it was no longer a threat. Interestingly, one of the people involved in the investigation of the Foo Fighters was 
Colonel Howard McCoy. When you look at the ghost rockets, one of the people involved in this was Colonel Howard McCoy. Now you move into 1946, he set up an unofficial investigation of UFOs in 1947 that morphed into an official investigation. McCoy's fingerprints are all over this thing. So you say, well, gee, you know, this guy has been involved in these sorts of things. By the time you get to 1947, 1948, he's been involved in it for, for five or six or seven years. So he supposedly knows what's going on. So you've got all these problems with the UFO phenomenon. So, so Roswell is not really the catalyst. The catalyst for the United States is the Ken Arnold sighting, which for some bizarre reason got all the publicity. There were sightings prior to that, some of them very interesting. Mm -hmm. But they got no publicity until Arnold made his report. And then you started getting lots and lots of uh, flying saucer reports. So you get to July 8th when the Army announces, hey, we captured a flying saucer here in the, here in the Roswell area. Three hours later, the higher headquarters, the 8th Air Force in Fort Worth, says, man, that's a weather balloon. These guys just made a mistake on this Ray and target weather balloon thing, which is a nonsensical explanation because if the guys at Roswell couldn't identify a weather balloon they, when they saw it, right. you certainly don't want them involved with the atomic weapons. And they're the only atomic strike force in the world at the time. But, you know, it, it's funny that... That it was stated that they had captured a UFO, right? Instead yeah, uh, of captured, no, captured a flying saucer. They okay, captured a flying, a, captured a flying saucer instead of recovered because it was a yes. crash. Or is this a slip up that someone made that there were actually was a recovery, and I that think, the and that the crash was a cover up? I think if you take a look at that whole press release handed out by Walter Hot, you find a lot of stupid errors in it. Uh, Walter Hott says he flew it to Fort Worth. And the question came back to him, well, how did Marcel, oh, Marcel flew it to Fort Worth? And the question came back to him, how did Marcel know how to fly one of these things? Should have said he escorted the remains to Fort, to Fort Worth. So there was a lot of problems with it. The real question is, why did they issue the press release in the first place? It makes no logical sense. I mean, if you, you've captured a flying saucer, yeah. clearly... If, if, if it is, in fact, a flying saucer, an alien spacecraft, something from outer space, mm -hmm. you now have your hands on a technology that would put us far beyond any of our com competitors in the world. And the last thing you want to do is alert them to this thing. And they put out this press release. It makes no logical sense. And, and that was one of the questions I just cannot answer. Why did Blanchard order the press release? He clearly ordered it. He's the commanding officer at the 509th. It goes out under his authority, regardless of what the newspaper says. And... Uh, and then General Ramey at the next higher headquarters says, nah, it's a weather balloon. And, and you got to wonder why these guys who are supposedly the, the top guys in the uh, Army Air Forces mm -hmm. at the time, the guys with their, basically their fingers on the atomic triggers, uh, can't identify a weather balloon in a Raywin target when they've seen it. And, and we know that they were, were uh, introduced to these during Operation Crossroads, which was the Bikini Atoll test in 1946. The 509th was directly involved with those because they had the B-29s that had the capability of dropping atomic bombs. They, called, they were called silver, silver plate B-29s. The uh, bomb bays had to be modified to hold the atomic bombs. And one of the things, one of the things they used, one of the, equi the equipment they used at the time were the Ray-1 targets and weather balloons. So they were clearly familiar with these things. Well, they should have been anyway, Kevin. Stand by, my friend. You and I have to yes. take our news break at the bottom of the hour. Exo Nation, our guest this hour is Kevin Randall. His website is kevinrandall.blogspot.com. And we're talking about Kevin's new book this hour, Roswell in the 21st Century. The evidence as it exists today. And uh, Kevin and I will be back on the other side of this news break as we continue here in the XO from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada on the Mutual Broadcast Network. Don't go away, everyone. Talking to Kevin tonight about his new book entitled Roswell in the 21st Century, The Evidence as It Exists Today. 
Kevin, you've done a lot of work over the years. You've written about Roswell. You've investigated Roswell. You've gone down to Roswell. You've debated Stanton Friedman about Roswell. What does Kevin Randall believe, based on his expertise, not only as a UFO investigator, but as a colonel in the in the armed services and that means you're a very intelligent person kevin as well as your experience as a law enforcement investigator well if you're asking what do i believe about the roswell case yeah it's nowhere near as robust as we thought it really proves when you get down to the bottom line all you have is the testimony of some people who saw strange things nobody saw the craft in the sky with the exception of a couple people who were talking about something that sounds remarkably like a meteor fall. You have a few people who, whose testimony you can lay on talked about having handled debris, which clearly was not, doesn't seem to be anything terrestrial. I think mm-hmm. specifically Bill Brazel here and uh, Jesse Marcel Jr. Uh, with others who, who handled the debris talking about it. People sincerely believe what they're saying. We just don't have any evidence to prove anything. We've got a very interesting case, but but we don't really have any evidence. Uh, it's if you if you ask me to rate it now, in uh, sort of the, the spectrum of UFO cases, it ranks way down toward the bottom, simply because we don't have we have we have a, a, a single I think of it as chain of evidence, yeah. which is basically testimony. With level land, for example, you have the craft interacting with the environment. You have the possibility of a landing trace from the descriptions of people, say, what they said. You've got eyewitness testimony from all around the level land area. When you look at the Roswell case, we don't have all that robust information. And then we'd stack that up with the documentation that, that's been discovered over the last um, 15, 20 years. I mean... People are saying, well, there's no crash recovered debris, and some of these people should have known. And they're telling us there's nothing like that. That's very worrisome. So when you're looking at the Roswell case, I'm saying, well, you know, it's just not as good a case as we as we once thought. We look at it and say we have some very interesting testimony. Yeah. That's really all we have. Then we look at all the other crap that is attached to it. We've got to deal with MJ-12, which is clearly a hoax. We have to deal with the alien autopsy, which is clearly a hoax. Yeah. We've got the people connecting it to the San Augustine crash in 19, saying in 1947. All of that comes down to a single source, which is Barney Barnett. There is no other evidence. You say, well, we've got a whole pantheon of, of witnesses. But when you talk to them, they're all telling the story that Barney Barnett told them. So you've got a single witness there. <laughs> what just happened. I'm sorry about that. It must be the aliens trying to get a, a message across. I, I thought I'd, I'd talked into your next heart. No, no, something. my friend, you didn't. You didn't. <laughs> but uh, the, the point simply is, um, you know, we, 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 we don't have the kind of evidence you would think we would have. We had to put up with the Roswell Slides nonsense last year, where supposedly this was the evidence. They've got a picture of an alien creature, and it turns out to be the mummy of a poor child that yeah. died some two or three hundred years earlier. I am I am just flabbergasted that the guys with the slides couldn't figure that out prior to, I think it was what, uh, they, they met on July or I'm uh, sorry, May 5th down in Mexico City mm-hmm. with their presentation, and by, by May 7th, we all knew what it was. They, they, they investigated for three years. The Roswell Slides Research Group, which is a bunch of skeptics, decoded the placard in the sign and said, this is a poor, unfortunate child. Now being exploited by the UFO community um, to, to make a point. We've had to put up with all that sort of nonsense. And it just, it... it has detracted from the case. It's made it more difficult to research. We've had to deal with these ancillary issues. And when we get right down to the bottom of it, like I said, all we have is a witness testimony. I find some of that testimony very credible, but I stack it up against the documentation, which says, yeah, we'd really like to get some crash recovered debris. And these were classified documents that uh, these guys were telling the truth as it was, and they were the guys who should have known. But what does this do to what the other... The other ufologists and researchers are, 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 are peddling to the public about Roswell, New Mexico. And I'll, I'll point the finger at Stan Friedman. 
I think Stan, I think Don Schmidt, I think Tom Carey yeah. sincerely believe what they're saying. I think they uh, cherry pick some of the evidence. They ignore the the contrary evidence or just poo poo it with a bunch of propaganda phrases like, well, absence of evidence isn't evidence of absence, unless, of course, there isn't any evidence. Or, or we've done our due diligence, well, your due diligence led you down the wrong path. Uh, but I think they sincerely believe they're telling the truth. And I know Tom specifically really wanted the slides to to prove that there was a crash at alien uh, a crash at, at Roswell so we could move beyond that investigation into another arena he just sincerely really wanted to believe so badly I think it just colored his thinking but where does this leave the public those who want to believe those who look at these so-called experts for the the proof that extraterrestrials really did crash in Roswell, New Mexico. And what does this do to the conspiracy theorists who believe that the government of the United States of America is perpetrating a cover-up and a conspiracy? Oh, oh we, we can prove there was a cover-up. I mean, that, that goes without saying. There's the documentation to prove it. It just doesn't prove that Roswell was really an alien spacecraft. Yeah, that, that's what I mean. But, you know, a lot of people look at the fact that the lack of proof is the proof that the government is suppressing the information or covering up the fact that a UFO crashed in Roswell, New Mexico. We can say the government is covering up information. We can say that there was a conspiracy to keep all this stuff quiet. If you look at the Condon Committee report uh, uh, from 1967, begin, beginning in 1967, this was the University of Colorado report that was done. We have a letter from Lieutenant Colonel Robert Hippler of the Air Force saying, here's what we'd like you to do. We'd like you to say something positive about the Air Force. We'd like you to say that there's no scientific evidence or there's nothing of scientific value if we continue this study. The Air Force has done a good job, and we should end the project. And the, and the, the, the men at the Common Committee, specifically Robert Rose, Rowe, look, Lowe wrote back and said, yeah, we can do that. And so the, the conclusions were drawn before the ink was dried on the contracts. Condon is actually heard 18 months before the report, final report is due, saying, uh, I don't think there's anything to, to this, but uh, I'm not supposed to come to that conclusion for another 18 months. So, I mean, here, here was a cover-up. They had information. They were, they were hiding it, trying to convince the people there's nothing to UFOs. The evidence that, that they had suggests there's something interesting going on. One of the cases was solved by saying it was a phenomenon so rare it had never been seen before or since. I'm thinking even if it's a natural phenomenon that that is that rare, something of scientific value could be learned by studying that. But that wasn't what they wanted to do. They wanted to say there's no, there's no, no involvement in national security. We should stop this investigation, which, by the way, is an Air Force mission. If, if there is somebody intruding on American airspace, uh, it is the job of the Air Force to intercept that object, whatever it may be, and determine what it is and whether it needs to be escorted out of our airspace or engaged. You know, that, that brings up another interesting point. Since Roswell, New Mexico was the, you know, the atomic base, let's just call it that, would they have not had a sophisticated ground-to-air radar system in not place? In, not, in, not in June and July of 1947. Hadn't been installed yet. Um, they, when they had needed to use radar mm -hmm. for practicing their missions and whatnot, they had to go to another base. The radars, they had radar officers, but that was a radar in the aircraft, not ground-based radar. They didn't get the ground-based radar. And, and I think it was January of 1948. I, I could be wrong on the date, but in Ju June and July of 1947, there was no ground-based radar in Roswell. All right. Now, before you were talking about um, the V-1 rockets and... Uh, apparently, what you said was, I believe, that uh, who was it went through the files? Uh, but with George Knapp, for one. Okay, I, I, I solved that mystery, why there was nothing mentioned about the V-1 rockets or the UFOs. Hillary Clinton was responsible for the correspondence. <laughs> oh, man, I, I try not to hear her name. Uh, Don't poke your ears out now. The, the, the problem is... They started with the political ads in May yeah. of 2015. 
The first political presidential ad we got in the state of Iowa was in two thousand May of 2015. It was it was Rick Perry's ad, and we have been putting up with this crap since then. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to bring you back harsh memories. <laughs> and then we've got to put up with Donald Trump too. I mean, well, you, you know what? I I for one hope that Donald gets in. I don't think I could stand two Clintons in your White House. Uh, I hear you. Because then Monica would want to move in. Yeah, but Hillary wouldn't let her. And she would be the boss this go while she was the boss mm. the last go around, too. True. Um, but, uh, you know, the, 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 the thing is, when we look at the UFO phenomenon, mm. well, one of the things the, the Condon Committee said, they found no evidence of secrecy. Right. There was nothing, no, no secrecy. Yet, they had a couple of um, the scientists were cleared for secret material so that they could look at the blue book files and everything classified secret. There was a series of sightings in Belt, Montana in, I believe, March of 1967. It was 1967, may have been May, March or May of 1967, where UFOs were seen intruding on the missile bases. So the Condon Committee is there talking to the um, UFO officer, a guy named um, Chase, and they're asking about this problem with the missiles. And he says, I can't tell you about that. That's national security. So inside the Condon Committee, they knew there was a national security implication here. Uh, I don't know. I, the, the, the sightings are very interesting. Um, and, but the, the point is, the Condon said we had access to everything, but their own records show that they did not. So there was some kind of national security implication in these sightings around Belt, Montana, because it dealt with uh, the missiles and shutting down of a, of a flight of missiles from the from an outside source. Is that the Robert Salas story? No, this actually precedes Salas. Salas, Salas came in a week later of this, but if you also look back, there's a there's a thick file in the Project Blue Book files about sightings in Belt, the Belt, Montana area. So it's not just Salas. There's documentation for it. There's a number of sightings for it. The, um, uh, the a number of high-ranking officers were called out to the site where the thing supposedly landed, away from the missile silos. I might add, the missile silos. Where the, the missile silos around those bases are scattered out over, you know, literally hundreds of miles. Um, but there, so there were sightings close to Belt, Montana. So there, there is a documentation. So you, you can take Salas out of the equation, and you still have a series of very interesting sightings. But the real point is there was stuff going on there that the Condon Committee did not have access to because it, it impacted on national security. Now that is very interesting. But that does not prove that Roswell was an alien spacecraft. That, that is true as well. Were there, were there any independent witnesses to the the UFO itself or the or its crash? Or you mean in Roswell? Yes. There was there's a fellow named William Woody who was 11 or 12 years old at the time. Mm-hmm. Who he and his father were out painting a barn or something late at night, and they saw the thing a thing flash over overhead and, and seemed to land. Um, not that far from Roswell. Now, if it's a meteor or a bolide or something like that, people on the ground often think it's it's, it's landed just over the um, the horizon. Yes. Well, Woody tells us the next not the next day, but a couple of days later, they went out to see if they could find this thing, and they were turned back by a cordon off um, Highway. It was at 285, I think, north out of Roswell. The military had set up cordons on the dirt, dirt roads, the gravel roads leading off into that area west of uh, west of the highway uh, out of sight of the road so you had to drive up to him to see that they were actually there he's not the only one that told us about these cordons we, we've run into a number of people who told us about that so we, William Woody saw the thing in the air we have uh, Frankie Rowe who was the daughter of uh, firefighter Dan Dwyer who uh, unfortunately died before any of us got to talk to him but he did share some information with his family but Frankie tells us she handled a piece of the, the, the memory metals the stuff that you could wad up and it would unfold itself that sort of thing so we have some independent witnesses like that the problem is they all appeared after Jesse Marcel told his story in 1978 so you can make the argument they were contaminated by the, the publicity of the of, of Jesse Marcel's stories being told at on uh, uh, programs like In Search Of, uh, syndicated programs, told in um, national 
newspapers, unfortunately, the, the national newspaper would be the National Enquirer, and of course the publication of the Roswell Incident book in 1980. So you've got that factor contaminating these things. Sheriff Wilcox's wife, Inez Wilcox, wrote a story called Four Years in the County Jail, and it was about her time as the matron in the jail where her husband served as a sheriff. And in that story, she, she has a, a, a paragraph about the, the UFO crash and the, the recovery of the little bodies. The problem is the story is not dated. It is, it is an addition to the story, so it appears she wrote the story and then was was inspired to add this story later on. We learned that she died in 1989, so clearly she could have been influenced by the Roswell incident story. If she dated the darn thing and it said you know, something something really neat, like February of 1975, then we've got a document that predates all of this stuff uh, that we can hold up and say, you know, but yeah, here's somebody talking about it prior to Marcel getting the publicity. Uh, the only thing we have like that is Lydia Schleppi. She was the teletype operator. Mm -hmm. I believe it is KOAT in Albuquerque, their station, owned the station KSWS in, in Roswell. And she's on the telephone with John McBoyle, who's a reporter for it. And she's on the teletype putting out the, the story of the flying saucer. And she gets this message that says, do not transmit. Um, there was a mechanism if there was an incoming message on the teletype, the bell would ring and she'd flip the switch. And All right, Kevin, stand by. We've got to take our final break for this hour. Exo Nation, Kevin Randall's our special guest, www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com. And Kevin and I will be back on the other side of this break. Don't go away. The Exxon, I am Rob McConnell. We're coming to you around the world on the Mutual Broadcast Network from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Dr. Kevin Randall is our very special guest this hour. He's got a brand new book out entitled Roswell in the 21st Century, The Evidence as It Exists Today. First of all, Kevin, as always, I want to thank you so much for joining us. Great pleasure talking to you. Oh, I'm delighted to do it. Um, we've got a We've got about four minutes, Kevin. How can we best wrap this up and get our listeners to go wherever they can buy your book? Because I've, I've had the opportunity of reading it. I love it. It answers a lot of questions, and it also connects the dots that not very many people would actually do. Well, first, let me go back to our last segment with Lydia Schleppi, because there's an important point to be made there. We have the documentation. It's from 1976, so mm -hmm. we actually have a little bit of documentation that predates all of that stuff. So, I mean, that's an, that was the important point to getting getting with Lydia Schleppi and what, what, what she was doing. Um, the book itself was designed to uh, provide where the investigation was today, kind of strip all the nonsense out of it. Mm -hmm. You know, um, this witness we thought was really, really great. Uh, Walter Hott told us about Frank Kaufman. Frank Kaufman, you can believe he's he's golden. You, anything he tells you is true. Frank Kaufman was making it up. So what does that do? That casts a doubt on Walter Hott, because if Walter Hott was as deep in this as he claims, if he was well connected as he claims, he would have known that Frank Kaufman was making up his story. So you have to wonder if there was some, there's some kind of conspiracy there to keep the story alive in Roswell. It is a great boon for the town. Uh, they have their festival every year. It fills up the hotels. It probably brings hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars, into the local economy each year. And, and you have to wonder, was this something that Walter Hott and, and Glenn Dennis and Max Littell designed and the evidence um, was manipulated so that a lot of us would believe things that, that turned out not to be true? And what I wanted to do is look at all of that sort of stuff and determine whether or not we could believe this. What does the evidence actually say? Not the evidence that it proves it was alien, not the evidence that suggests it was a, a hoax, but what does the actual evidence say and where does it lead us? And unfortunately, it doesn't lead as much any of, of, of anywhere. So in your, in your opinion, 
what should we do about Roswell? Forget it and move on? Oh, well, I think we ought to move on. Yeah. I, I think it's taken up way too much of our time. Um, it should be more than a footnote in the ufological history. It, it, because it, it does have an important role, but the role isn't necessarily proving that we're visited by aliens, but how these things sort of evolve from a story that was told in 1947 into this full-blown thing with alien bodies and a spacecraft and uh, all of this this sort of thing going on today. Uh, we're coming up on the 70, 75th anniversary, and I, I think, and, and of course this is why I will never be invited to Roswell again to speak, <laughs> is, and, and, and that's okay. Yeah. Um, but but the point is, you know, I mean, you want people to. I want people to know the truth, and and there are people out there who want to know the truth. But unfortunately, there's too many people who want to believe. You know, think of Fox Mulder with his uh, X Files and the and the poster on the wall. I want to believe. Yeah. That's the problem. They want to believe, and they won't listen to the contrary evidence. On the other side, there's the people who I don't want to believe. You cannot convince me, and it doesn't matter what you align in the way of evidence. They're going to ignore it or make up answers. Uh, actually, people on both sides make stuff up, so it, it just does not help us. And I try to sort through that, and uh, by doing so, I make no friends. Kevin, Except as always, time goes by so fast when you're with us. Exo Nation, Kevin Randall has been our guest this hour. www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com, and the name of his book is Roswell in the 21st Century. I'll be back on the other side of this a break with the news from the Mutual Broadcast Network newsroom as we continue here in the X-Zone from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. My name is Rob McConnell. Whatever you do, don't